gay man coming to my practice who had unexplained lymphadenopathy. And lymphadenopathy is swelling of lymph glands. It could be in the neck, under the arms, and there was no easy explanation for it, as well as this peculiar occurrence of pneumocystis carinii pneumonia in gay men in San Francisco and Los Angeles. We began to realize that this wasn't just a crazy homophobic media story. There was something serious going on here. I was totally paranoid and scared shitless. I was in a state of perpetual paranoia. And so was everybody. Everybody thought, oh my God, I've got it. So this young nurse had been admitted to the hospital the night before uh, in September of that year, came to my office with a purple spot on the bottom of each foot. And biopsy showed that it was Capsi sarcoma. Kaposi sarcoma had been recognized as a very rare form of skin cancer. Um, little reddish or purplish lumps appearing on the skin, uh, often on the feet, and um, mostly seeming to affect older men. Normally, there are fewer than 20 cases of Kaposi a year in the United States. But in the last 18 months, more than 300 cases have been reported. The Kaposi sarcoma that was affecting the younger gay men as part of this emergent new condition of, that became known as AIDS was far more aggressive, far more disseminated. The, the thing about it that sort of vaguely got my attention was the idea that it was an infectious cancer because there aren't any infectious cancers, by and large. Well, there are some cases of something we don't really know yet what it is. They, they all seem to have immune deficiency. We have no idea what's causing it. Is this a something, okay? Is this something we should all know about? I'm beginning to, to kind of come to terms with, with that. I remember in San Francisco, people called it gay waiter's disease. But of course, I mean, gay waiter was like a redundant phrase in San Francisco. A lot of people got it, bang, bang, bang. With the airline mostly, we were all over the place. It's, it's hard to explain how you feel at a time where you can die if you do what? I don't know. It was a, a time when we didn't stop partying and having sex because that connection hadn't been made. But there was an unease in the gay community about did we actually dare go out you know, into a club and uh, you know breathe the air from all these gay people. It's a bit difficult in the sense of sometimes you need to know what you're looking for in order to find it. And when you really don't know what it is, it becomes that much harder to find. You didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that this was going to be a problem when you saw two cases and then four cases and then eight cases. I mean, that's an exponential growth. My hunch at the time was that this was going to be an epidemic. And unfortunately, my hunch was right. I think when we realized what a big epidemic it was, it became very frightening. You know, how is this going to end? I remember talking to a very prominent virologist in Boston who said, what if it becomes airborne? And I, all I could say is everybody will die. It was a terrible period because of the uncertainty. You don't know exactly how is it transmitted. Am I infected with a, a death sentence here? There, there were all sorts of weird theories. Uh, the, the most common was poppers. Poppers are wonderful. <laughs> they make you feel a sense of euphoria. They're basically vasodilators, so they give you they give you a quick high. And uh, they were being used a lot amongst gay men. And everybody was praying that it was going to be poppers, you know, because we could give up poppers. Or it was going to be s and or it was going to be fisting, or it was going to be something we could give up. Gay men were getting a lot of infections at that time, hepatitis and amoebas and whatnot, and it was thought that they were overloading their immune systems, and this, what you were seeing, with AIDS, which was clearly an immune system disease, was the result of this overload. Was this the CIA? Was this an urban myth? Let's let's ignore it at all costs because it's a, it's got to be a it's got to be a right wing plot, and certainly the right wing exploited it and demonized us in in exactly that way. So it's very understandable that 
people like myself or Gaetan would plug our ears somewhat, especially in the early years, even as we started to see friends getting sick and friends dying. Throughout the summer of 1981, we recorded interviews from AIDS cases. We're struck by how sick they were, also about their lifestyles, that they tended to be very sexually active gay men, traveled a lot, used a lot of drugs, but we didn't know what the risk factors were, so we developed a case definition, distributed to doctors, health departments, teaching hospitals, and asked cases we reported to health departments and then to CDC. Bill Darrow was a, a research sociologist uh, in the STD division and an expert on sexual behavior, uh, both in gay men and in heterosexual populations. We get this report that three men in Los Angeles are, all, are in the same hospital, they apparently have the same condition, and the lover of one of these men says, and the three have had sex with one another. This suggests that it's not poppers, you know, he didn't say that they were sniffing the same substance, that they had sex with one another. That's when the question came, well, are there any other sexual connections in Los Angeles? Let's have Bill Darrow fly out to Los Angeles and pursue the possibility of a cluster of cases connected by sexual contact within the last five years. So the first patient that came in was actually a flight attendant. And um, he, he said that, you know, um, one of my sex partners has been the very attractive steward who flies for Air Canada. A handsome guy, really nice guy. And I've had sex with him. Can you tell me any more about him? Well, he kind of has an accent. Um, can't remember his name. In the afternoon, we talked to a second person and gave a very similar story. We had to drive all the way out to Orange County to interview this third person. And we got around to this business of naming sex partners. And here comes this same French-Canadian flight attendant. Can you remember his name? He said, you know, I think I've got a card or some information in my address book. Let me, let me go see if I can find it. So he excused himself. He went into his bedroom and he came back with a big smile on his face. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. Here's his name. I had sex with him on Thanksgiving, 8709 Club, and afterwards I came down with hepatitis. And then he came back in December, I had sex with him again, and I bet that's when I got this disease that I've got now. What's his name? He says, here it is. Dugas had experienced fever and noticed swollen lymph nodes since January 1980. When I met him, he had two visible spots of chaos, visible when he's wearing clothing. One was on his forearm, and one was on the tip of his nose. The CDC numbered the cases in the order in which they came to the attention of CDC, the order in which they were reported. So there had to have been 56 other people reported to us before he would re report it to us. And so that's how I found out more about him, and then I followed up by calling him and introducing myself, and lo and behold, you know, before anything else happens, I'm meeting him in New York. I'm flying up to New York the next week. There was certainly a lot of fear because there was still a lot that was unknown about it, and so I had no idea what the impact was going to be on me um, as a result of having had sex with Gaetan. So uh, we were just a, a group of us all had just gone out to uh, to a tea dance in the afternoon, and he was a friend of a friend of mine, and one thing led to another, and we ended up going home together. He was very full of life. He was charming. Um, he just had a lot of fun, a lot of energy. Yeah, it was definitely risky. I was I bottomed for him. So a week after we had... Um, gone home together, I was talking with this mutual friend of ours, and I was saying, you know, he seemed like a really nice guy. And he said, oh, yeah, he's got that weird gay cancer. And I was like, what gay cancer? I'd never heard of it. It was the first sort of time that anybody had even referenced something like that. And I sort of let it drop. And then um, I started to hear a little bit more about it. And then I started to see uh, news about it. And so that became much more, again, embedded in my mind. And it was something that started to really impact my thought process. This was something um, 
with the potential to impact our community and, and, and other communities in, in much bigger ways. And so suddenly all of these boys who had had to hide who they were for years and pretend they weren't and deny to their parents that they were gay and they weren't married because they were bachelors. We don't have bachelors anymore. Suddenly they could be who they were. And now we had a disease come along and say, you can't do that. We'd finally found our moment in time where we could have sex, where we could have affairs, we could do what we wanted. Finally, and no one could say, no, you can't do that anymore. And to have AIDS crash into that party. Oh my goodness. So you had on the one hand, this gay sexual liberation and, and people really experiencing what it was like to be gay in a way they'd never been able to do before. And a move to the right from a government standpoint, it was a perfect storm because it allowed that group to come in and say, this is the price you pay. What you are and what you do is wrong. The disease that only hits gay men, hits them in their sexuality. I mean, it, it was like the perfect metaphor for the homophobia of the whole society. And it did seem to me that reality is not supposed to come already packaged in metaphors. You know, it's like everything we gained was, looked like it was being taken away from us again. I still remember a relative in Europe when they found out that I was gay, they just turned to me and said, well, AIDS will get you. The timing of it all was really eerie. So there is something uncanny about it. It's very Shakespearean, the way that this happened. To have this breakthrough, to get this incredible outpouring um, of support, of acceptance, of a community coming into its own, of demanding a, a place at the table, of having great success in almost every sector, and then to just be wiped out um, as if in some diabolical plan. Willie Brown actually said this to me early on. He said something to the effect of this occurring right now with gay rights just having happened would be like telling black people they have to go back to the back of the bus. When I went to interview the out of California case. I was very impressed with him. He, he seemed like an intelligent person. He was very well dressed. At the time, he didn't have any hair because he had just completed a round of chemotherapy. But he was very concerned about his condition and about the concern of other people as well. Uh, because many of his friends in New York City and even some in Canada had very similar symptoms to the symptoms that he was experiencing. And some of his friends were so ill that they had died. So he was very cooperative when I started asking him questions about his sex life. And I said, how about your sex partners? He says, well, I can remember a few of them, but gee, I've had so many. And I hope you understand why. I'm in a different town every night. I'm a young guy. So I go out every night and I have fun. So he averaged about 250 different sex partners a year. I said, do you have an address book? A little black book. He says, I do. I said, would you mind sharing the names with me? He said, no, I'll be glad to. And he started reading me names. He read me 72 names before he said, it's 6.30, I've got to go. If other people had the same amount of information that he had, we probably would have been able to make many more connections and been able to have solved this jigsaw puzzle much faster than we did. Here is the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. In this report, there are no figures, there's no graphs, but there is reference to an out of California case. Everybody gets the idea that this guy, at that point, was the person who brought AIDS to California. That was sort of, it wasn't called AIDS yet, by the way, at this point, it's still called GRID. GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency, which made the whole disease seem as though it was the result of somebody's sexual orientation rather than action, some action they had taken, something they had encountered, a microbe 